Following on from the video on Zorvental, the great game of the dragons, we touched on some ancient history of the elven atrocities inflicted on other species over the last 30,000 years on the planet Toril, one of which was the destruction of a remarkable human empire that was unlike anything before and nothing like it has happened since. You see, Jamdath was a Siocratic empire. Its ruling class was composed mainly of those with phenomenal mental powers called psionics. Scholars will refer to this as the Dath Empire, for its founder was a potent psychic warrior king of the ancient human folk living in a large valley past the rather dangerous mountains on the southern border of what is present day Termish. His name was Jam Dath, and during his life he united the various human settlements who lived to the north of the elven kingdom named Nekirimath. The fact was, these settlements had been attacking each other for generations. To this very day, the people of the interior lands of Faerun, the Chondathans, are... Hmm, well, let's have a little chat about them, shall we? Because this is a topic I rarely mention, the different human ethnicities on Faerun. Chondathans are slender, tawny, or fair-skinned people, with brown hair ranging from almost a tawny blonde to a brown so dark it looks black. They are typically tall, taller than most other human ethnicities and have brown, hazel or green eyes. They live widely dispersed across Faerun now thanks to their love of exploration and trade. They are very business minded, not devout or overly civic minded people. They don't put a lot of stock in the morals and ethics but they put a great deal of stock in the value of their word as a business person. They are quick to judge others based on their appearance of wealth and prosperity. From ancient times until today, Trondathans are independent and care more about their current business ventures than they do about almost anything else. So if there is wealth to be had, you can trust a Chondathan to be right in the thick of it, leading the effort. Still, when time gets tough, the Chondathans will move on to look for better opportunities fairly quickly. There are a few places where Chondathans make up the bulk of the population, and this much I can say about their shared cultural traits. They like cats and consider them lucky. They keep dogs. They greatly value horses. They are fiercely competitive and highly self-reliant. They look upon acts of altruism and selflessness with bemusement and surprise. Do not expect charity from Chondathans as a general principle and do expect swift and brutal treatment from them if you seek to steal from them or inflict losses on their property and business interests in any other way. Still, they typically don't give a damn about your religion. They consider taxes and such to be nothing more than organised crime by good-for-nothing officials that are to be avoided in favour of paying out whatever fines they inevitably inflict on them for tax evasion. As has always been the case, magical talent is not common with Chondathans. They are much more likely to use magic items than to learn the art themselves, and there are very few sorcerer bloodlines. Given this and their love of trade and their ancient history, you can expect a Chondathan to get along well with dwarves, gnomes and hin, or hobbits or halflings as you prefer, and not get along very well with elves or half-elves, nor are they very friendly with the Milan of the Far East or the Aluskans of the Far North, and they do certainly not trust the plain-touched or orcs of any kind. So, the history of the Dath Empire is the shared history of the bulk of the people of El Tumbul, Chondath, Cormir, the Southern Dale Lands, the Dragon Coast, the Great Dale, Plondeth, the northern shore of the Vilhon Reach, the Pirate Isles of the Sea of Fallen Stars, Sembia, and Sespech. You might expect there to be a lot of Chondathans in Termish, but in fact they make up only around 4% of the population there. The centre of Faerun is dominated by the Sea of Fallen Stars, or to those who live beneath that surface, they call it the Sea of Seros. This great body of water plays a role in the fate of the Dath Empire, but also the ancient sea elven empire within it suffered a terrible and undeserved fate, as we shall discover. The real atrocity was not simply the destruction of the Empire of Dath, but also that of the sea elves who had done nothing to provoke the situation at all. But we're getting slightly ahead of ourselves. First, we must go back a few thousand years in time. Jamdath was founded... 7,296 years ago, according to the current calendar of the Forgotten Realms. King Jam founded the city of Dinalith, 
and it was the first of 12 cities that were built along the verdant Vilhon Valley, a wide and attractive land that formed a natural trade hub between the Sea of Seros, the Lake of Steam, and the Shining Sea on the far southern coast of Faerun. Or, I should say, all the many kingdoms and city-states clustered around the shores of these bodies of water. Just over 7,000 years ago, the Sea of Seros was ruled by an empire of sea elves called Ar Salmiler, who had been in power there for a good 10,000 years, happy to rule beneath the waves. They didn't need to interact with the races of the surface world, at least until the nation of Netheril arrogantly invaded their realm, creating three crystal-domed cities beneath the water. It is not known well today, but the pantheon of the gods humans worshipped those many thousands of years ago included a god called Uppensur, the master of the invisible, lord of reason, the serene one, a god of human psychic power who played a key role in the rise of the Dath Empire. Thirty years into the growth and prosperity of the city of Dinalith, a prophet of Uppensur arrived wearing the god's symbol of an eye covered by a hexagon gem. His name was Lazic Silvermind, and he offered the people of Dinalith a direct message from his god that they were to flourish under his guidance. Uppensur's first directive was that all slavery would cease and the practice be banned wherever the people of Dath ruled, and in exchange, Lazic was divinely inspired to create a spectacular psionic artifact called Anudoxius, capable of bestowing psychic powers into others with a range that stretched for miles beyond the borders of Dinalith. It attracted a great number of talented Dathians to the study of the mental arts, while the freedom from slavery the nation promised swelled the population with refugees from all over Faerun. Although this occurred nearly 2,000 years before the beginning of the Empire of Netheril, it does seem quite similar to the magic Mithalars, which provided magical power, broadcast over a wide area and powering all kinds of magical devices. It's not unreasonable to say that the Eudoxias of Jamdath were the inspiration for the design and function of the first Netherese Mithalar, created 4,500 years ago by the arch-wizard Ayalum. However, the Eudoxias had a much deeper legacy, incredibly ancient and otherworldly, tracing all the way back to a primordial species named the Spellweavers, but that is a tale for another time. With the spread of the Dath people and their amazing mental powers, the culture of the Dath shifted rapidly. Within a decade, Lazic Silvermind established the Udoklian University, formalizing the training of people with psychic abilities, and within another decade, in accordance with Uppensur's plan, Jamdath replaced its former oligarchy with a psychocratic system of government. This was never going to be a process without a great deal of resentment from the former ruling dynastic bloodline, but things were going exceptionally well for the Dathian people, and it's hard to form a rebellion in a time of prosperity. The prosperity stretched on for an amazing 4,000 years, during that golden age of Jamdath, although right before that began, there was a great disruption in the empire of Emaska, far off to the east, which most other nations were kept unaware of. 5,866 years ago, the empire of Emaska was struck by the twin disasters of a terrible plague and also a blight which destroyed their crops and plunged the nation into famine, killing many thousands of people and causing a revolution which nearly wiped out the priesthood of their imperial religion. Four years later, a great portal was opened to a world named Earth, and hundreds of thousands of people from there were enslaved and brought to Toril to plant crops and restore Emaska to its former power. These new people are now the ethnic group of humans known as the Mulan on the world of Toril. So, during that 4,000 years, the people of Faerun had three major empires existing at the same time, the oldest being Emaska, the Psyocracy of Jamdath, and the rising empire of magic that was Netheril. Jamdath did come into conflict much later with the new nation of Untha after the fall of Emaska, but its people who lived within the 12 cities along the Vilhon Valley became a rather xenophobic culture. The ember of resentment in their ancient dynastic Dath bloodline was still there, and this is where the sword theme comes into it. Jam Dath was a warrior king, and once his descendants lost their hereditary right to rule, the families turned all their efforts to making sure they bred as many powerful psychics into their bloodline as they could. Plus, they took to wearing a sword day-to-day, -day, openly as an homage to their warrior origins, 
and the Twelve Cities became commonly known as the Cities of the Sword. They were very impressive cities constructed of beautiful white marble. There was a temple university in the centre of each and orderly streets radiating outward. The temples were not really places of worship, they were places of education, like a lively and peaceful university campus. The long age of prosperity came to an end eventually. First, the incredible empire of Netheril quite literally fell into disaster 1,835 years ago, as the archwizard Carsus cast his avatar spell and caused all magic to temporarily cease across the world of Toril. There is a famous account written by the Jamdathian admiral Joran Molth, who was on board a sailing vessel called the Sea Mind. He wrote of watching the floating nethery city of Naloth plunging into the sea, a sight which horrified him so badly he became obsessed with ensuring such a fate never befall his own people. However, Jamdath's own end would come only 63 years later, ironically because of the action of the Admiral's own grandson, who was raised with this impressive intellect focus on his grandfather's vision of an eternal Jamdathian empire ruling over all of Faerun. 1,772 years ago, a new and dominant force emerged in Jamdath as the powerful Metamind Darian overthrew the nation's blade lords and declared himself Emperor of Jamdath. The Imperial Jamdathi forces aggressively expanded their reach, rapidly moving south, west and north into the lands around the Sea of Fallen Stars. Jamdath turned all of its efforts into expanding its navy, with the construction of a great many ships, utilizing tons of timber stripped from the forests of the Chondal Wood, the homeland of Nekirimath elves who were killed wherever they dared oppose the destruction of their ancient trees over the next 20 years. The elves also witnessed hundreds of political activists among the Church of Uppensur being imprisoned, many publicly executed for treason, and most suffering the fate of being psychically brainwashed into becoming loyal to Emperor Darian. The Emperor almost abolished religion and took all the ancient Eudoxias into custody, but part of his overall plan was to put the minds of the priesthood to work in finding a way to avoid the fate of Netheril by any means at their disposal, including the study of magic, both arcane and divine. One of the cities of the sword named Garant tried to succeed from the Empire but was brutally crushed by Emperor Darian, with a great number of people executed. So, 1,751 years ago, after suffering 21 years of slaughter of their population, the devastation of their forest homeland, and witnessing ever-increasing brutality from Jamdath's new emperor, the remaining Nekirimath elves, desperate in the face of utter annihilation, turned to elven high magic and called forth a cataclysmic tidal wave from the Jamdath Bay, rising a mile high. The water slammed into the Vilhon Valley with unstoppable power, instantly destroying all of the twelve cities of the sword. This event was so monumental that it forever reshaped the face of Faerun, transforming the Jamdath Bay into the even larger body of water known now as the Vilhon Reach, after which the surrounding region was named. While some isolated towers and keeps built atop higher ground escaped the destruction, they eventually sank due to the altered seascape. The only remnants of Jamdath that survived untouched with those graveyards and outposts built far from the Twelve Cities, such as those found among the Isles of El Tumble. The basin floor beneath the Vilhon Reach was littered with the ruins of Jamdath. Psionic power slowly leaked from countless psychic items, corrupting local flora and fauna and creating new aquatic monsters. The sunken cities became inhabited by all kinds of evil aquatic creatures in the deep water, and to this day, many of the ancient ruins have never been explored or plundered fully. Now, if you recall, I mentioned the terrible fate of the sea elves of Seros and their empire named Aracelmilar. This is what actually occurred. It was only four high mages of the Nekirimath elves who completed the high magic ritual, forming the one mile high wave. But you see, to create this wave, they unknowingly raised the Asalbane monolith, a massive plateau that rose under eastern Khorisimal, the uh, capital city of the Sea Elves, just shattering the city and instantly killing 40,000 people, primarily Sea Elves, including the ruler of the empire. The debris of both Khorisimal and Jamdath was then dragged out by the receding water and went on to kill around 35,000 more people. 
This led to the almost immediate collapse of the Sea Elf Empire, and every former vassal population in Seros immediately began vying for control of the Empire, throwing the Inner Sea into chaos and beginning the Sixth Seros War. Aquatic Elves were subjected to brutal retributive purges that didn't end for 15 years and decimated their population. Back on the land, the chaos caused by this disaster got so bad that the gods got directly involved and even destroyed a lesser god named Valagan. The scattered survivors of Jamdath travelled to lands north and east of the Sea of Fallen Stars, founding the Kingdom of Impultur in what is now known as the Great Jamdath Exodus and a couple of centuries later the founding of the nation of Chondath. Over 1,500 years after Jamdath's collapse, the landscape of what came to be known as the Vilhon Wilds changed drastically following the catastrophic events of the Spell Plague, and as water levels in the region receded, the spires of the Twelve Cities emerged from the sea for the first time in over a millennium. But things got back to normal, and now they are deep under the water again. There is a great deal of history that I've skimmed over for the purpose of this video, but I posted a full timeline on my Patreon page for members to take a look at. Lots of research for this video. I have a list of links you can follow in the description to see what I was reading to learn as much as I could about the human history of Faerun, and in the meantime, thanks for listening, and as always, I will be back with more for you very soon.